So today, we're going to look at some verses found in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 3. But first, I just want to say that Ecclesiastes has been said to be the most philosophical book in the Bible. It's a written analysis of one's life. And it's an essay about the meaning of life. The author is King Solomon, a man said to be the wisest and smartest man in his time. He gives us a very honest approach to life. He takes us on a mental journey through his life. And you'll learn everything he tried, everything he tested and tasted, all of which he said was useless, foolish, pointless, empty. For the longest time, that's what he said. Life was meaningless, he said. And remember, these words were coming from one who was, had it all. He had tremendous power, wisdom, and wealth. Now, when you read this book, you might think at first that he is trying to destroy hope when he goes through everything he's been doing in life and what he's been experiencing, but he's not trying to destroy hope. In fact, he's just going into a lot of detail about life's experiences in the first two chapters, and he does it really for the purpose of directing our hope to God instead. Because what he learns eventually is that... Without God, life, that's when life is meaningless and without satisfaction, whereas with them, totally different. So the purpose of his writing is to spare other people, ourselves, for example, the pain and the bitterness of having to learn through all those different life's experiences, and it's just to help us learn sooner rather than later that apart from God, life is meaningless. And, you know, it's interesting because what Solomon said about 3,000 years ago, people are saying and doing today as well. I mean, just two weeks ago, I had a conversation with a young woman who said, for the longest time, I thought, okay, if I graduate, I'll be satisfied. If I get married, life will be fulfilling. When I've got kids, it's going to be full of meaning. But then she said to me, no, I still wasn't satisfied. I wasn't content with life. I was still anxious in my life. But now, now that she is in a good relationship with her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, she was baptized just a couple of weeks ago. She says she is in a different place. Her life has purpose, meaning, and direction. And she was saying what Solomon said, apart from God, there isn't meaning But with him, there is. So the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a search for meaning in life. And we all search for meaning and purpose in life, don't we? I think today's reading will help us think about this even more. And today's reading is taken from chapter 3 in Ecclesiastes, the first 11 verses, verses you've heard many times before. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid laid on the human race. He's made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So, 
So in this chapter it says, there's a time for everything, and everything on earth has its special season. Seasons are an integral part of God's plan. Life is punctuated with seasons. Just as punctuation marks add meaning and variety to written communication, causing the reader to pause for understanding, accelerate with excitement, or end abruptly at the end of a sentence, so seasons bring meaning and variety into our life. In nature, there's progression from one season to another, winter, spring, summer, fall. In our lives, there's progression of change in our, from one season to another as well. As surely as seasons direct the course of nature, they direct the course of our lives too. And if we cooperate with the seasons of life, we can experience productivity and fruitfulness. But if we struggle against them, we will be anxious and will be frustrated and will be unsatisfied with our life. Now, in the last few years, I've noticed myself using the word season much more than I used to, and I think a lot of us do. You meet someone with kids the same age as yours, and you quickly know what season they're in. When someone has a toddler, when someone has three teenagers, kids in college, you know what season they're in. Honeymooners, maybe short season, maybe long. (laughs) Empty nesters, or if someone says to you, my mom just moved into the hospice, you know what season they're in. We all know about seasons. Seasons are subplots to the narrative of our whole life. They are like a chapter in the story of our life. In the passage we just read, Solomon lists examples of seasons that we might be in right now or at any time in our life. And I'll just mention a few right now. Verse 4, for example, it says, there's a time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, living with a broken heart might be the season you're in right now. You probably know of someone who is in the season of mourning right now. I do. And there are probably people who will be walking in here today, sorry, with a broken heart. And those who are walking in here today, we just hope that, we just want you to know that we're glad you're here. And we hope that God will inject hope and encouragement into your life today. But you know, in the same verse, it says someone might be mourning, but also others are dancing. And perhaps that could mean that there's a new child that's been born, child was adopted, door of employment was opened, someone graduated, their team won, someone was accepted into their school of acceptance. All I'm saying is there's a time for mourning, there's a time to dance. Verse 6, time to keep things, time to throw things away. Ever been in the mood to get rid of clutter? Simplify your life. (laughs) I know we've had garage sales periodically because it's been time to purge. And I admit that after putting things out in the garage ready to get to put on sale, I'll take something back. I'll start feeling a little nostalgic. They'll remind me of my mother and I'll put it back in the house. That happens sometimes. Sometimes we keep, sometimes we throw away. The other day, Michael went to get his bike out, wanted to go for a ride, was looking for his helmet. So did that go in the garage sale? Time to keep, time to throw away. Guess I did made a mistake there. <laughs> Can't seem to find it. <clears throat> Verse 7, time to be silent and a time to speak. With all the noise in our culture, it's hard to hear the quiet whisper of God. And especially when he is trying so hard to direct us and encourage us and guide us and, incur- and correct us. And it's hard when the noise level is so high or when you become so busy in life. And because that's true, there's one man who realized his head was being filled with so many voices and so much information, so he decided to try a different routine for a while. For 30 days, he said he would cut back on social media. At first, he didn't know what to do with his hands because he was usually texting or tweeting. But... The decision was to go without social media first thing in the morning, sit in the chair with God for a few minutes first, then interact with his family, and then go to the smartphone. 
he decided to give this a try because he really did feel he wanted to make room for God in his mind and not just everything else. And so you see, there's a time to be silent. But in the same verse, it says there's a time to speak up. For example, you might see someone you know who is running off the rails or making poor choices. You might see something happening at work that just doesn't sit right with you. And your preference might be to stay silent. But if a friend is heading for trouble or something is being done at work that is on the edge of integrity, it's time to say something. Even though we might risk our job or friendship, there are times when we must speak up. And usually, we end up being glad that we did. Time to be silent. Time to speak up. There is a season for every activity under heaven. Seasons, we know what they are. We know that we experience different seasons at different times. What's important is that we recognize the season that we are in and how to be in that season fully. At Christmas, it's often said, Jesus is the reason for the season, but there's a reason for every season. And lessons God wants to teach us in every one of them. One man was beginning to feel restless, not content with his life, felt that he was living out his parents' dream, not doing what he really wanted to do himself. So he became very down as a result of that, drank a lot, and as long as that's how he coped with his lesson of restlessness, well, that was going to be a long one. But when in a season we need to look at what's going on and pay attention to what God might want us to learn about ourselves and how we live, and he doesn't want us to escape, and he doesn't want us to put the blinders on. In every season, we need to keep in mind that God's demeanor towards us is goodness, always. And so he always has good lessons to teach us. And so each time we need to think and ask what some of these lessons might be. In the season of loneliness, for example, God might want us to learn more about his presence and his closeness and his friendship. And that could be because when we know in our hearts that God is with us all the time, we can be anywhere in the world all by ourselves, but we will not feel alone because we know that God is with us. And in the season of loneliness, it could be that God wants us to really come to know that. Or someone might be in the season of loneliness and at that time be encouraged to get up and take some relationship risks Go out and meet people, sign up for a small group, shake a hand, suggest you have coffee with someone because God knows that good earthly friendships are important too. So you see what I'm saying here, loneliness, same season but different lessons. It depends on the person, depends on the situation they're in. But in every season, God wants us to learn something. Dennis Conner, American yachtsman, had four wins in the America's Cup. He was familiar with great seasons of success. 1983, he had lost the American Cup, ending 132 years of successful defense by the New York Yacht Club, and it was a devastating loss. And after it happened, he entered a season of despondency. He wasn't sure he even wanted to live anymore. He said it was so hard dealing with the humiliation the meanness of the press, and the self-doubt. But when in that season of despondency, he could either give in and play the victim, or he could learn what he had to learn, which he did. He looked within himself at that time. He saw who he really was. He believed in himself that he was good, and he was grateful for the life he was given. And so he picked himself up moved on, took the cup back in 1987,
But in that season of despondency, what he tells us now is that he learned things about himself that he would not have learned otherwise. In the Bible, Job was in a season of loss too. He lost his land, his crops, his family, he lost it all. But in that season, he said, though he slay me, I'll still trust him. In other words, in his season of loss, he learned what it means to trust God and have hope in God no matter what. And then there's the Apostle Paul, who was afflicted, put in prison, treated horribly, and in his season of weakness, he learned that strength comes to us, a strength that's not our own, When needed, God infuses strength. He infuses it into our frailty, and we're given the strength we need to carry on. Different seasons, different lessons. You might be familiar with the book titled One Minute Manager. Millions of copies have been sold over the years, Ken Blanchard being the author. And when he wrote that book, he was far from God. He was in a season of professionalism and financial success. And he was a well-sought-out author, speaker, and business consultant. But he said he woke up one day and he said to himself, you know, I'm not really that great at writing, and I'm not really that clever. And so he began to think about what's going on around him. And he started to think about the reason for his season of success. And he says that it sensed, he sensed something was trying to get his attention at that point, trying to teach him something. And so he thought, okay, I'm going to figure out who's behind this, why I'm thinking this way, why I'm feeling this. And he did. And today, Ken Blanchard is a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, telling the world that Jesus is the greatest leadership model in the world. All of that came from a season of blessing. What season are you in? What are you learning? We're all in a season right now. But what we need to remember, too, is that seasons change. In other words, the intent is not for us to stay in one season forever. And sometimes we get stuck. And sometimes we stay in one season for far too long. For example, one minister talks about someone who started to come to church, was welcomed, talking to people, said he hadn't gone to church for years. Bad experience when he was young. Too many rules, Sunday school class, mm -mm, didn't go well, had a problem with his pastor, so he left church, left God. Decades later, finally came back to church after attending for a while, getting quite involved. It was suggested that he might move more into the area of having a personal relationship with God, be more intentional about that, but immediately said, "Mm -mm, those childhood experiences, things that I was told about that, mm -mm, not going there. That man was stuck, stuck in a season of bitterness not moving on, and that's sad because he was missing out in much more that was in store for him. But sometimes we get stuck in a season. Maybe some of you are stuck in a season right now. Is it time to move on? If it is, may God give you the encouragement and the ability to do so. Whether it's a matter of dating someone who just isn't right for you, and deep down you know that. Maybe it's time to move on. If you're in a relationship and someone's hurting you, maybe it's time to move on. Something happened in the past that's making you cynical and critical. Maybe it's time to move on. And you know, whenever it is time to move on, it's on our hearts to do so. And I say this because of verse 11. It says, God sets eternity in the hearts of men and women. 
In other words, deep down, we know there's something more. Deep down, we know that there's something else God has in store for us. We know there's life beyond the grave. We know there's more to this life, too. There's more to learn each day. And God puts, us in a, puts that in our hearts to think beyond, to look forward, and to know that there's something more. Deep down, God sets eternity in our hearts. He puts it on our heart and lets us know when it's time to move on. I'm glad he does. Life is all about seasons. And I ask again, what season are you in right now? Can you name it? I encourage you to take the scripture that we're referring to today and read it sometime during the week and really think about the season that you are in right now. And then maybe meet somebody for coffee, engage in conversation, and state the season that you're in. Once named, pay attention to what God's trying to teach you this time. What lesson is to be learned? And then again, talk to someone about what lesson is being learned, because that can be exciting. And then if you think you're stuck in a season, and in your heart you know that you should be moving on but can't, again, talk it over with a friend and ask together, is it time to move on? And if it is, God will give you the strength to do so. Today I'm just saying that it's important. It's important to recognize the season we're in, It's important to cooperate with the season we're in. And it's important to be in each season with God fully. Because then lessons will be learned and our lives will be productive. They'll be fruitful and never will we say life is meaningless. As it says in Ecclesiastes 3.1, it's true. There's a time for everything, and everything in earth has its special season. For everything, there's a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Let's pray. Lord God, We hear what you're saying, and we understand that there are different seasons we find ourselves in. And just as there are different seasons in the year, different seasons in our lives. And it is important for us to acknowledge and try to understand them, because we want to respond correctly to them and get the best out of our time here with you. Thank you for promising to be with us in every season. Help us trust that you're at work in every season and know that we want to be open to the presence of your spirit in every moment. Jesus, you conquered death, you conquered the grave, and so you've made it possible for us to endure the victories and the defeats of our seasons. We're going to trust you with the timing of events. In each one, we ask that you let that eternity you put into our hearts be at work, help us believe that there's something beyond our understandings, and all of it reflects something good, something that comes from you. Don't let the world distract us from things that you want us to see and things you want us to learn. It's good to know that seasons don't have to last forever, because as you know, some of them are hard. And for those who are in sorrowful seasons of life, we pray that the gray clouds will be blown back before too long so that the warmth of your love will be revealed once again. We're sorry if we pushed you away at times. 
We're sorry if we haven't learned the lessons that you've been ready to teach us. And we're sorry if we've stayed stuck when we should have moved on. But thanks for forgiving us. Thanks for the work that you did on the cross because it just reminds us that you love us and that you're ready to take us by the hand and help us go forward in productive, fruitful, and fulfilling ways. For the difference it makes when you become part of our life and involved in each season, we give thanks today. Amen.